Hey, Bethel Church. That was a clip from the great 1952, before I was even born, the great 1952 classic, High Noon, where a town marshal awaits his moment of reckoning, the big gunfight when the train pulls in at High Noon. And I showed it because the pace and the tension of that clip reminds me of the pace and the tension of the passage that we're going to be looking at today as we continue our short study of the book of Genesis. In chapters 18 and 19, we'll be looking at a moment of reckoning of a town called Sodom. In the midst of it all, there's much for us to learn about righteousness and justice as well as mercy and forgiveness. So please open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 18 where we'll be focusing on the large section between verse 16 of chapter 18 and chapter 19 verse 29. We're gonna be moving right along. If you didn't bring a Bible, you should find one of ours in the racks under the seats around you where this passage begins on page 13. If you don't own a Bible, please take one of these. And if you're using an electronic version, we which we encourage, I'm using the ESV or the English Standard Version. It begins, ironically enough, at high noon on the day God came to supper. Abraham and his family are living by the oaks of Mamre. Everyone is resting in the heat of the day when suddenly three men are standing in front of Abraham. Abraham invites them into a luncheon and then he puts on a feast because these are not just three men. The word we translate Lord throughout much of this passage is the name Yahweh. This is God himself. Some say it's a pre-incarnate Jesus, though the passage doesn't say, along with two of his angels. During the meal, the Lord says that by this time next year, Sarah will have a son, which should remind Abraham of God's covenant to give him offspring. And then we pick up the action starting in verse 16, verses 16 through 19. Then the men set out from there, and they looked down toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to set them on their way. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. The Oaks of Mamre are thought to be about three miles north of Hebron. And after the meal, it's it's late afternoon by now, God and his two angels and Abraham walk to one of the places that still exist in the area where they can look down and see the Dead Sea as well as the plains east of the Dead Sea towards Sodom. And as they stand there looking, God reveals to Abraham not only what he's about to do to Sodom, but also why he's telling Abraham about it in advance. According to verse 9, Abraham has been chosen by God to teach his children, the nation of Israel, and, and ultimately the world, ultimately us, about righteousness and justice. Sodom and Gomorrah are to be an example of what happens to those who choose to reject righteousness and justice. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, Peter says God made Sodom and Gomorrah an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And so in the future, and you know, for that matter, us, in including right this moment and in this sermon, can say, do you want to know what God does to people who reject righteousness and justice? Just look at the smoldering ruins. You see that smoke? That's what happens. So at this point, we need to consider the sin of Sodom and by extension, Gomorrah. Very often, we tend to see it very narrowly as sexual sin and even more narrowly as homosexual sin. And to be sure, sexual sin, including homosexuality, was at least one aspect of the sin of Sodom. In Leviticus 18, verses 24 and 25, God warns Israel not to practice the sins of the Canaanites. And prior to that warning, he specifically names some of those sins. One is sacrificing their children to the god Molech, but the rest are all sexual in nature, including homosexual sex, incest, voyeurism, adultery, and bestiality. Now, since Sodom is a Canaanite city, and he was just talking about the Canaanites there, we can reasonably assume that such sins are part of their culture as well. And that's verified not only by the narrative ahead of us in in chapter 19, but also by Jude 7 in the New Testament, where Jude specifically says that Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire. However, having said that, I think it's a mistake to limit the range of Sodom's sin to just sexual sin. I mean, we get there from the narrative of chapter 19 where sexual violence is certainly emphasized, 
But if we limit it to that, the message that we come away with is here's what God does when you mess up sexually. And I think there's far more going on here than that. To understand the depth of the depravity of Sodom, we need to consider a significant amount of data from Scripture, starting with verses 20 and 21 here in chapter 18. Then the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Now, we shouldn't conclude from verse 21 that God is, as an omniscient, omnipresent being, actually has to physically go to the scene of the crime before he's sure of Sodom's sin. That's not the point. I mean, after all, back in verse 17, he makes it clear that the verdict is already in and the sentence has already been passed down. I think he sends the two angels for our benefit in order to prove that judgment, that, that the judgment from a just and righteous God is thorough and complete. It, it's like he's going, yeah, I checked all this out. You can see this. But to get back to the nature of the sin of Sodom, in verse 20, the word we translate sin simply means to miss the path. God said, here's the righteous path, and sinners say, but this is the path I want to follow. The word grave means weighty or abounding with. And so it speaks not so much of the severity of sin as if there's a high level uh, of sin of Sodom, but of the all-inclusiveness of it. Sodom is filled with sin. That's the point. The word we translate outcry is used in the Old Testament to describe the cry of distress of people who are oppressed and brutalized. It's the cry of moral outrage against an unfair arrogant, insensitive enemy who thinks nothing of the suffering of others. In Exodus 22, 22, it describes the cry of the oppressed widow or orphan. In Deuteronomy 24, 25, the cry of the oppressed servant. In Exodus 2, 23, the cry of Israel enslaved in Egypt. And that's consistent with some of the other references we find to the sin of Sodom in the Old Testament. Jeremiah implies that the sin of Sodom includes a life filled with adultery, but also a life filled with lying as well as a life filled with strengthening rather than stopping the hands of evildoers. And instead of stopping evildoers, you help them. Ezekiel says that Sodom was guilty of a haughty pride and having excess food and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. In the New Testament, Peter implies in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 10, that Sodom's sin included the lust of defiling passion, but also despising authority. And Isaiah 3, 9, back to the Old Testament, implies that one of the more disturbing aspects of Sodom was their lack of shame. They boldly proclaimed their sin as normal. And even more shocking is that the outcry reached God's ears. The outcry that is reaching God's ears comes from Sodom itself as they victimize each other with their sinfulness. The abused cry out to the Lord and then the abused in turn become abusers. That's what's going on. Here's the point. Sodom certainly was involved in sexual sin, including homosexual sin. To deny that by focusing on other aspects of Sodom's sinfulness is to ignore and even misdirect the biblical accounts in an attempt to trivialize one aspect of Sodom's sin. However, to say that sexual or homosexual sin was all that Sodom was about is also, I think, to ignore and even misdirect the biblical accounts and again, to trivialize a different aspect of their sin because the sin of Sodom was much more than sexual. In Sodom, God was dealing with a culture that had become so corrupt, so depraved, so unwilling to live as he sees fit rather than as they see fit that he can no longer tolerate their presence on the face of the earth. They have returned to what mankind was before the flood. Every intention of the thoughts of their hearts is only evil continually. And we need to pay attention to that because that sounds an awful lot like our world. I know we don't like to admit that, but depravity abounds. And no, I'm not just talking about gay marriage. According to Reuters News, last week ISIS, that group that's gaining ground in Syria and Iraq, crucified eight rebel fighters in Syria for being too moderate. That was the charge. The United Nations reported that 2,400 Iraqis, 1,500 of them civilians, died in June through armed insurrection. At the same time, UNICEF reports that throughout the world, 22,000 children die every single day as the result of poverty. 
In 1860, just before the Civil War, when slavery was very often legal in much of the world, there were 25 million slaves throughout the world with a median price of $135. Today, the the Sum All Foundation reports that though slavery is illegal worldwide, there are 27 million slaves today with a median price of $140, five bucks more after all these years, which is about three tankfuls of gas total. And we hear about those things and we think, hey, but, but that's the world. That's not our world. We're in America. It's not like that here. And you know, that's true. However, we can find many cities and many, many neighborhoods in the United States where it isn't safe for us to be out alone at night, just like Sodom. Boy, if you read the news last week, look what happened in Chicago. 50 people, 50 people were victims of gunshot wounds. Well, today, as then, violence is often inflicted on the most helpless, wives, children, the elderly. Only now it's often posted proudly on the internet for everyone to see. More than 50 million Americans have trouble putting food on the table. Though 40% of our food, $165 billion with a B, $165 billion worth is thrown away every year. We throw that in the garbage while people go hungry. And the Justice Department says that every year, 300,000 children are kidnapped and forced into sex trafficking in America. According to a congressional letter, it's rarely the buyer, but more often the trafficked girl who is punished for what is essentially child abuse and child rape. That's depravity. You say, but pastor, that kind of stuff doesn't happen here in Nebraska. Yeah, I mean, that happens in the United States, but, but not here. Last year, KPTM, a TV station in Omaha, reported that Interstate 80, which runs right past our city, it's just a little ways down the road here, and pretty much keeps us in business, is a major human trafficking route. It it reported that hundreds of girls, some in their early teens, are being sold as sex slaves in truck stops. And it raises the question, is it happening in our truck stops? The hand of the evildoer is strengthened and sin, whether sexual or otherwise, is normalized and becomes the law of the land. In his book, No Place for Truth or Whatever Happened to Evangelical Theology, Christian historian David Wells writes, there is violence on the earth, the liberated search only for power. Industry despoils the earth, the powerful ride roughshod over the weak, the poor are left to die on street grates, the unborn are killed before they can ever see the rich and beautiful world that God has made. The elderly are encouraged to get on with the business of dying so that we might take their place. What's he saying? Sodom lives. It's all around us. It's not some other place and some other time. It's here. The depravity that drove it drives this world, this country, and many, many lives. But, and it's important that we catch this, God always hears the cries of Sodom. He always hears the cries of the poor, of the disenfranchised, of the abused, of the starving. He always hears the cries of the slaves. He always hears the cries of the unborn who never are allowed to see one day of life and one day God will deal with it. How do we know? Because he's just and he's righteous and he'll deal with it justly and righteously. A fact that should either scare the daylights out of us or motivate us to action. Abraham Abraham is motivated to action, but he doesn't do what we might expect him to do. He doesn't do what we might do. Today, Christians are very quick to go on the attack and call down the wrath of God. Dan Wooding, a journalist and founder of Assist Ministries, writes that even when he was a writer for the British tabloids in his younger days, he never received the kind of anger-filled emails and mail that he regularly receives from Christians these days, attacking just about everything, including other Christians. One man, he said asked him to recommend a church, but the man wasn't looking for a church that teaches the Bible and preaches the gospel. He was looking for a church that speaks out against Rick Warren and Chuck Smith. You catch that? He was looking for a church that hates what he hates rather than a church that loves Christ. A lot of us are like that these days. When someone crosses us, when the legislature doesn't vote the way we want them to vote, when the courts don't decide the way we want them to decide, even when someone we know and trust doesn't see things the way we see them, we start calling down the wrath of God. Go get them, Lord. 
And so when God says to Abraham, I'm going to deal with Sodom, we might expect Abraham to reply, hey, nail him, Lord. Sick him. Just grind him into the dust and oh, let me watch. That's not what happens. Look at verses 22 through 33. Very, very important section here. So the men turned from there, that's the angels, and went towards Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. It's just the two of them now. Then Abraham drew near and said, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place, this place and, and not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, if I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Abraham answered and said, behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. I, who am but dust and ashes, suppose five of the 50 righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. Again, he spoke to him and said, suppose 40 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak. Suppose 30 are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. He said, behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak again, but this once. Suppose 10 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham and Abraham returned to his place. Abraham's logic is pretty straightforward. Since God is both righteous and just, he's thinking, it, it's not possible for God to destroy the righteous along with the wicked. Now, now, of course, unlike Abraham, we have the complete word of God and we've read passages like the 73rd Psalm, which struggles with the prosperity of the wicked compared to the misfortune of the righteous. Or Isaiah 57, verses 1 and 2, which speaks of the righteous, man's peri- righteous man perishing as a protection from evil. The righteous are destroyed so that they will escape evil. Or the book of Job, where we see that often there's a righteous reason for suffering that goes beyond our perception. We've read Luke 23, 43, where Jesus tells the man on the next cross, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And so we know that very often in this sinful world, the righteous suffer right along with the wicked just because we, say, we, we happen to share the same world and the same humanity and the same oxygen, if you will. But in the end, those who follow the Lord are immune from worldly tragedies because there's another life after this one. We know that we'll have to suffer through tragedies here, even death itself. But we also know that in the end, Jesus wins along with all who follow him. Abraham doesn't know that yet. He just has faith that God's going to do something. But I don't want to focus on Abraham's argument here. I want to get away from that. I want to focus on his intent. With all that he knows about Sodom and the, and the sin and the depravity that actually defines it, Abraham doesn't call down God's wrath like we might. He doesn't say, go get him and let me watch. But instead, he intercedes with God on Sodom's behalf. He prays for Sodom. This is a prayer of intercession. I know it's not like us because God is physically standing right in front of him, but it's a prayer where he asks for mercy rather than judgment, not just for the righteous, but for the wicked. He says, Lord, if you find 50 righteous men there, can't you spare the whole city? He's living out Matthew 5, verses 43 through 45, where Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of of your, your father who is in heaven. I mean, we hear that and we choke. You're kidding, right? Abraham just lives it. He's come a long way, hasn't he? This is also a great example of persistence in prayer. Abraham sounds like a backward auctioneer. Will you destroy Sodom for 50 righteous? No. Well, then how about 45? Do I hear 40? Now 30? Now 20? Now 10? The text implies that he would have kept going except God, who I think is doing this for Abraham's as well as our benefit, walks away when he reaches 10. It's just, okay, I've heard enough, turns around. Abraham then returns to his place, which implies that he stepped out of his place to even do this. But here's the point. When it comes to the Sodom that surrounds us, we're to follow Jesus' command and Abraham's example. 
We're to pray for them. We're to pray for their salvation. We'll pray, we're to pray that they'll recognize their sin and repent and turn to Jesus so that they can be in heaven with us. Pastor, wait a minute. Are you saying I'm supposed to pray for child molesters and drug addicts and street gangs and human traffickers? Yes, I am. But don't pray for them because I say so. That's not the point. Pray for them because Jesus says so. That's the point. As depraved as Sodom is, Abraham lifts them up in prayer to the Lord. It seems like we ought to be able to do the same thing for our world, doesn't it? In fact, we're even supposed to pray for politicians we don't like. Paul wrote that in 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2. We're to intercede for kings and all who are in high positions, which for us includes people like the president, the Supreme Court, senators and representatives, mayors, policemen, teachers, school board members, aldermen, judges, lawyers, dog catchers, even the ones we disagree with, Pastor? Yeah, especially the ones we disagree with. D.A. Carson said, because it is a democracy, there are things we ought to be doing to draw the line here and there, even if you understand that laws don't finally engender justice. But at the end of the day, if you can't do it with compassion and gently and leave the doors open for evangelism, you destroy everything. He goes on, I think one of the devil's tactics with respect to the church on the right today is to make them so hate everybody else that at the end of the day, they can't be believed anywhere on anything, not even in the proclamation of the gospel. In other words, we're not supposed to pray that all hell breaks loose. But we are instead to pray that all heaven breaks loose. We're not to pray for God to smash the sinners. We're to pray for revival. And we're to be ready, willing, and able to let God use us to make that happen. However, back to the text. The sun is setting. Sodom's remaining minutes are ticking away. And so we read in the first three verses of chapter 19. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed bowed himself with his face to the earth and said, my lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. They said, no, we will spend the night in the town square. But he pressed them strongly. So they turned aside to him and entered his house and he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread. And they ate. Now, it is impossible for a human being to leave Mamre in the afternoon and to get to Sodom by evening, okay? But these are angels, all right? They can do things like that. When they get there, Lot is sitting in the gate by Sodom, and he offers them a place to stay. They refuse, choosing instead to stay in the town square because they're testing the city. They want to see what happens. But knowing what will happen to them, if they do that, is, is horrifies Lot. And so he insists that they come with him anyway, and they do. However, as we see in verses 4 through 11, Sodom refuses to ignore these visitors. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house. And they called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. Lot went out to the men at the entrance, shut the door after him and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, stand back. And they said, this fellow came to sojourn, and he has become the judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man, Lot, and drew near to break the door down. But the men reached out, that's the angels, reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great, so that they wore themselves out, groping for the door. Now these days some argue that the phrase bring them out to us that we may know them means something like, hey, we just want to get acquainted with these guys. However, since Lot classifies their request as so wicked and since he proposes an absolute hideous sexual alternative with his two daughters, I think it's clear that what's involved here is not a sin of hospitality but that the sexual perversity of the town has deteriorated into sexual violence. 
And notice in verse four that it's, in, that it's instigated by all of the men of the city, both young and old, to the last man. Lot confronts this crowd. He admonishes them for their wickedness and pleads with them not to behave this way. And they scream something like, how dare you judge us and go on the attack. Now that sounds, that sounds like something that should be very familiar to us because it's a common accusation made against Christians today. The Bible verse, the one Bible verse that everyone seems to know today is Matthew seven twelve. Judge not that you may not be judged, though not everybody understands what it means. The angels strike the, cl- the crowd blind, but notice that the crowd wore themselves out groping for the door. They're still outside And they're blind. And what that means is their depravity has become so all-consuming that even though they're blind, they stay on the attack. They can't see. And it's like, where is that guy? Blindness only slows their sin down. In 1999, a man named Christopher Miller was arrested and sent to prison for 15 years for holding up the Stride Right shoe store in Toms River, New Jersey. 15 years later, he'd served his time. He's now released. It's not like good behavior. He's just out. His sentence is up. 15 years later, the day after he is released from prison, he returned to Toms River, went into the shoe store, and robbed it again. Sin is not passive. We saw that in Genesis 4, 7, where God said to Cain, sin is crouching at your door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. We can ignore sin, deny sin, redefine sin as a positive thing. We can rename it as a mistake. We can normalize it, encourage it in other people, and hide it from other people. But sin will not let us go. It will always trip us up again and again and again until we deal with it, which means we repent of it and turn to Christ, the only solution that the Bible gives us for sin. Everything else will only just slow us down. Now, at this point, we need to look at Lot. In previous weeks, we've pointed out that when the Bible says that a human being is righteous, it doesn't mean that he or she always behaves righteously. We've seen that with Abraham. We've seen that with others. As we've seen, human beings are only righteous because God, because God in his grace, declares them to be righteous in spite of the fact that we're sinners, in spite of the fact that they don't always behave righteously. We obtain that gift of being declared righteous by faith. That is, our only role is to believe which God counts or credits to us as righteousness. That's what we find in Genesis 15, 6. We looked at that last time. And and Romans 4 and Galatians 3, 6, among other places. But once declared righteous... In this world, anyway, we still don't necessarily behave righteously. That might be our goal, but we can't reach it. Now, we know that Lot believes God because he came to Canaan with Abraham, just on God's say-so, just like Abraham, and he was with Abraham in Egypt and back again. And so it shouldn't surprise us when Peter says three times in 2 Peter 2, verses 6 through 8, that Lot is righteous. God declared him righteous because he believed. But Lot has a lot of trouble living that out. Though he undoubtedly knows the sinful nature of Sodom, throughout Genesis, Lot is constantly drawn to Sodom. It begins in chapter 13 after Abraham decides that the land isn't big enough for both of them. And Lot, he he goes to Lot and says, you choose. Lot chooses to go to the Jordan Valley to the east. And if you remember, in Genesis, east is often a symbol of moving away from the presence of God into the path of sinfulness. By verse 12 of chapter 13, Lot is pitching his tent outside of Sodom, even though verse 13 notes ominously, now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. By verse 12 of Genesis 14, Lot is dwelling in Sodom. And now here we are at chapter 19 as the angels arrive. Lot is sitting at the city gate where business deals are witnessed and ratified and carried out. And what that means is Lot has become a well-known figure in the city. He's the guy who endorses and ratifies contracts. There's more. As we read the story of Abraham in Genesis, Abraham's wife, Sarah, along with his nephew, Lot, are mentioned at almost every opportunity. Whenever they travel, it's they all went. But Mrs. Lot is never mentioned there. She's first mentioned here. 
it's very, very possible because of that, that Lot married a local girl from Sodom, reinforced by the fact that his two daughters are now betrothed to two local men of Sodom. And so even though Peter says Lot is righteous in 2 Peter 2 verse 7, Peter also says that Lot is, quote, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked in Sodom. And in verse 8, for, I, for as with that righteous man, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. The point is, Lot is conflicted. He's tormented. He's pulled. He is a righteous man, declared righteous by God. He believes God, but he's pulled by Sodom. And we see that in his behavior. There's kind of this flipping back and forth. When the angels come, he offers them protection because he knows the dangers. He knows what's going to happen to them if they go into the city. Yet he wouldn't live anywhere else. When the crowd comes, he confronts the crowd. He says, don't do this wicked thing. Yet in the next breath, he offers them his daughters, which is nothing less than despicable. He's willing to offend the crowd because he doesn't doesn't approve of their practice of sin. Yet he betrothes his two daughters to men of the city, who, by the way, are probably standing right outside of his door here with the rest of the mob as all of this unfolds. Remember, verse 4 says, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man, which would include his son-in-law's, Surround the house. On the one hand, the depravity of Sodom offends his sense of righteousness. But on the other hand, and at the same time, that same depravity draws him in. He's uncomfortable with sin, but he likes the comforts and the prosperity and the prestige that it offers. Kind of like a lot of us. I read about a study done at Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management in Chicago that says that we tend to overestimate how much self-control we have against temptation as long as we're not facing it. In other words, they say that we think we can handle more temptation than we actually can. Here's a quote from the study. Those who are most confident about their self-control are the most likely to give in to temptation. That's us. I mean, these are the guys that sell things to us. That's, that's what this institute does. They know what they're talking about. They know how to get us to buy things. They know how to tempt us. In the same way, Satan has something to tempt us with, something to sell us, and it's called sin. But like Lot, we think we can resist And so we'll walk right into sinful situations. By the way, Northwestern study offered a solution. Quote, keep a humble view of your willpower and stay out of tempting situations. End quote. Now there's some handy advice, huh? (laughs) We heard that before though. Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is is weak. Or 2 Timothy 2.22, so flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So we've got to at least ask ourselves, are we tortured by the sins around us? Do they bother us? Do they trouble us? Do they drive us to prayer? And if we're honest, many of us would have to say no. Many of us would have to say we're actually drawn to the sin around us rather than repulsed by it. Or at least we're able to turn a blind eye toward it and enjoy the pleasures that the culture offers. ChristianMingle.com, you've probably seen them advertise on TV, did a study recently, a survey of their people, presumably all Christians, and and to answer to the question, would you have sex before marriage, 63% said yes. Many of us acknowledge that Jesus will return someday, but inside, we secretly hope that it's not today. Why? Because today offers us so much. But here's the thing. God's people were always intended to live lives of righteousness and justice in a sinful world. Without becoming part of it, we're supposed to stand against the violence around us. We're supposed to help the helpless, feed the poor, stand against human trafficking, reach out to the pregnant girl considering abortion, become incensed at the depravity of selling little girls along Interstate 80. We are to share the gospel because Jesus is the only solution. And most of all, we are to intercede for this nation, for this state, for this city, and beg God to lead them to Christ rather than destroy them. In light of who we are in Christ, how can we stand and do anything else? And how, I might add, can we stand and do nothing? 
In verses 12 through 14, the clock continues to tick. Then the men said to Lot, have you anyone, that's the angels, said to Lot, have you anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone you have in the city? Bring them out to the place, of the place, for we are about to destroy this place because the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and said to his sons-in-law, who were to marry his daughters, up, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But he seemed, it seemed to his sons-in-law that he was jesting. Judgment is coming, but God will rescue the righteous, which in this case turns out to be Lot. There is only one man declared righteous in Sodom, and it's Lot. But as an act of grace, the angels tell him to offer salvation to others, to sons-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone you have in the city. In other words, anybody he wants. Now, Lot's daughters are only betrothed and not married, but betrothal was legally binding back then, so Lot had a couple of sons-in-laws. They're, that's, they're called sons-in-laws. He goes to the sons-in-laws. Verse 14 implies that they're right outside. He doesn't have to go far. These are not exactly fine catches, Dad. But they do what most of the world does today when we talk about the judgment of God and of Jesus Christ. They laugh at him. (laughs) Yeah, right. Judgment day is coming. Did you hear that? Yet the warning's real. And so like Lot, we must never let their laughter and ridicule prevent us from sharing the message of God's forgiveness. The tension thickens in verses 15 through 22. As morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he lingered. So the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. And as they brought them out, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the hills, lest you be swept away. And Lot said to them, Oh, no, my lords. Behold, your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have shown me great kindness in saving my life, but I cannot escape to the hills, lest the disaster overtake me and I die. Behold, this city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my life will be saved. He said to him, that is the angel, said to Lot, Behold, I grant you this favor also, that I will not overthrow the city of which you have spoken. Escape there quickly, though, for I can do nothing till you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zor. Now the sun is coming up and hell is coming for breakfast. That's what's happening. Both salvation and judgment will be handed out. Salvation because the Lord is merciful. The angels tell Lot to run, but drawn to the city, Lot holds back. And so they grab him and his daughters and his wife by the arms and they force him out of the city. They tell him to run for the hills and not look back or stop for anywhere, for anything in the valley. But Lot argues with them. He says, do I have to go to the mountains? I mean, there's a little village right over there. Why can't we go there? He just will not let go of Sodom. And so he picks a village in the corner of the valley for his own little Sodom. I think that when Jesus comes back, some of us are going to go, now? I mean, come on, Jesus. I I got a lot to do. Can't I have some more time? What happens here? The angels roll their eyes. It doesn't say that, but I picture them doing that. And they tell Lot that they will spare the little village that he's pointed to, which from now on will be called Zor, which means little. Lot doesn't deserve any of this. We have to understand that. This is an act of grace. He shouldn't be arguing. He shouldn't be talking back, but he is, and he's getting what he doesn't deserve. And at the same time, We don't deserve the forgiveness that's offered to us through Jesus Christ either. That too is an act of grace. But I want to point out this line from verse 22. Escape there quickly, for I can do nothing till you arrive there. In other words, Lot's entrance into Zor is the signal for judgment to rain down on Sodom. Now that explains part of what happens next. Verses 23 through 26 are zero hour. The sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zor. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Judgment falls because though merciful, God is righteous and just. The sun is up and sulfur and fire rain down destroying every living thing. 
But today, some seek natural explanations for all of this. An asteroid hitting the earth right there, volcanic activity, an earthquake, a random thermonuclear device. I don't know. But in the end, it really doesn't matter because ultimately, and this is the point, it's delivered by the hand of the Lord. The Lord God is carrying out judgment. But one of the biggest mysteries over the centuries is Lot's wife. And typically, three questions are raised. First, how could a simple glance to the rear bring about such devastating results? I mean, is God that critical? If I falter in my faith for an instant, am I lost? If I just look in the rearview mirror, am I gone? Second, why does she look back? And third, how can anybody turn into a pillar of salt? Well, first of all, it wasn't a momentary glance back. It's not like she's just going, and then boom. Verse 26 says that she was behind Lot, which doesn't necessarily mean right behind him, as if they're walking single file and she keeps bumping into him. That's not it. Remember, the destruction, according to the angel, can't begin until Lot reaches Zor. He has to walk through the gates of the city, which means that this happens when Lot walks inside of Zor while his wife is somewhere outside of Zor, probably at a considerable distance. Most likely here, we're not talking about a momentary glance, but a long, lingering look. She stopped somewhere along the way to longingly stare back at Sodom while Lot goes on ahead. This isn't a momentary failure. It's a decision. It's a choice. She has chosen Sodom over Zor. She has chosen destruction over salvation. But why does she make such a choice? Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 17, verses 31 through 33, as he speaks of the final judgment of mankind. On that day, let the one who is on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. And the implication there is that she looked back because she'd rather lose her life than her stuff. She liked what she had in Sodom. She liked how she lived in Sodom. In fact, she liked it more than life itself. She believed in it more than she believed in God. I have no idea what turning into a pillar of salt can mean other than turning into a pillar of salt. I have to take the Lord's word here at that. The point is, she suffered the judgment that awaits all who center their lives on the things of this world rather than on Jesus Christ. And the warning here is that we are not to make the same mistake, that we're not to be so focused on what's going on here that we miss what Jesus is offering us. Verses 27 through 29 take us back to Abraham. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. This is the same place where he prayed for Sodom. And he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley. And he looked and behold, the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of a furnace. He goes back to the spot where he had interceded for the city, where he stood before the Lord and prayed for them. And he doesn't see anything but smoke. This, there's judgment and that's all he can see. However, even though he can't see it, there's also salvation. Look at verse 29. So it was that when God destroyed the cities of the valley, God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had lived. In other words, God saved Lot because of Abraham's intercession on behalf of Sodom. And interestingly enough, the village of Zor is saved by Lot's intercession on their behalf. He said, can't I go there? And here's the question. Who will be saved because of our intercession? Who will be saved because we prayed and wouldn't give up? What relative, what friend, what acquaintance, what coworker will be saved because we said, Lord, save this guy, huh? I hear stories of people praying for 20, 30, 40, 50 years that their friends and relatives will come to Christ and then seeing God answer to those prayers. Who are you praying for? There's lots of people to pray for. Who are you praying for? But there's even more going on here than that. Remember when Abraham was speaking to God on behalf of Sodom and he started to sound like an auctioneer? You know, how about 40, now 30, now 20, now 10, and then God walked away. God knew 
that he would in fact be willing to save not just Sodom, but the world from destruction. And not for 10 righteous men, but for one righteous man. And that's good because there is only one man who is intrinsically righteous without God declaring him to be righteous. And it's not Abraham. And it's certainly not Lot. It's Jesus Christ. He was perfectly righteous. And on the cross, he suffered the judgment of God that was due for our sin. On the cross, God's wrath was poured out like it is here on Sodom, offering forgiveness, offering the righteousness of God freely to all who would have it. We obtain that forgiveness. We obtain that righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. We believe in him. We trust in him for the forgiveness of our sins. And when we do so, our sins are forgiven and we are declared righteous. We are sinners and judgment is coming for all sinners. That's one of the messages here. That's the bad news. When Jesus returns, God's judgment will make what happened to Sodom look like a 4th of July picnic. Our only chance to escape that judgment is through Jesus Christ. You can laugh at me like the sons-in-law laughed at Lot, but they weren't saved because they wouldn't believe. They thought it was hilarious. They were destroyed. You, You can hold up Hold on to all of the good things that you have now, like Lot's wife, and you can ignore me. Why would we want anything like Jesus when we have all of this? But like her, you will lose it all, and you will suffer judgment. But if you turn to Christ, and this is the good news, you will be forgiven. You will be saved. You might be thinking, how can God forgive me after the way that I have lived this life? And my answer is, the same way God can forgive Lot after the way he lived his life. After this, it gets even worse. He and his daughters commit incest, keeping the spirit of Sodom alive. Yet centuries later, Lot is still called righteous, not not because he behaves righteously, but because by the grace of God, he's forgiven and declared righteous. Here's my question. What about you? Have you been declared righteous through Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for setting this before us. And, it, and it, there's so much here. And it came so fast, Lord, that I just pray that uh, you still keep it on our hearts and our minds, maybe throughout this day, to remind us that you are just and righteous and therefore you will judge righteously and justly. But at the same time, you forgive righteously and justly as well. Help us to understand that. Lord, for those who follow you, I pray that you give us a real compassion, a genuine compassion for this world, that you cause us to stand for righteousness in the midst of it, even when it hurts, even when it's uncomfortable. And Lord, that you cause us not to condemn, not to call down your wrath on this world, but to pray for it. To pray, Lord, that the world repents of its sin and turns to you. Pray, Lord, for a revival. And Father, for those of us who don't know you, I pray that you remind us that one day you will roll all of this up like a scroll, including them. And Father, that you cause them to turn to you, to turn to Jesus in this moment and deal with the sin that separates them from you. We thank you for this lesson, Lord. Like I said, we pray that you keep it on our hearts and our minds. And we do all all of this, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.